I now call to order the 2015 annual meeting of stockholders of Hormel Foods Corporation. Here with me at the podium are Brian Johnson, Vice President and Corporate Secretary, who will act as Secretary for this meeting, and Deanna Brady, Group Vice President of our food service team. Each of you received a program as you came into the auditorium. It includes an agenda setting forth the business to be transacted at this meeting. The agenda includes the election of a board of 14 directors, ratification of Ernst & Young as independent registered public accounting firm, an advisory vote on executive compensation, and consideration of a stockholder proposal. We will follow this agenda and conduct the business portion of the meeting before we review our stewardship of your company's business. Ample time will be provided for questions, and I ask that you please hold any questions you might have for the question and answer period. Your program also includes the rules of procedure we will follow for this meeting. We will now turn to the business we need to transact for this annual meeting. Mr. Secretary, has proper notice of this meeting been given to stockholders, and do we have a quorum for the transaction of business? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Notice of the meeting was sent to all stockholders of record as of November 28, 2014, which is the record date for this meeting. A quorum is present at this meeting. Approximately 91% of the company's outstanding stock is rep represented here tonight, either in person or by proxy. Thank you. Proper notice of the meeting having been given, and since a quorum is present, I declare this 2015 annual meeting of stockholders open for business. The polls for voting on all matters are hereby opened at this time, 8.02 p.m. on January 27, 2015. The polls will remain open until all items of business have been presented. The Board of Directors has elected Jim Sheehan, Raleigh Ginsler, and Jim Anderson as inspectors of elections for this meeting. Our first item of business is the election of a board of 14 directors. In addition to me, the nominees for director are as follows. Attending our annual meeting for the first time is one of our three new directors, Gary Bourgeoisie, former chair chairman of Allianz Life Insurance Company of North America. Terry Cruz, former executive vice president and chief financial officer for Monsanto Company. Jody Farragan, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Hormel Foods. Dr. Glenn Forbes, former Executive Board Chair and past CEO of Mayo Clinic Rochester. Stephen Lacey, Chairman of the Board, President and Chief Executive Officer of Meredith Corporation. Our Lead Director, John Morrison, Managing Director of Goldner, Hahn, Johnson & Morrison and former Executive Vice President of Pillsbury Company. Dr. Elsa Morano, Director of the Norman Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture, Professor and President Emerita at Texas A&M University, and former Undersecretary for Food Safety at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Robert Nakasoni, Chief Executive Officers, NAC Enterprises, and former President and Chief Executive Officer of Toys R Us. Susan Nestegard, former President, Global Healthcare for Ecolab. Dakota Pippins, President and Chief Executive Officer of Pippin Strategies and former Director of Planning at Vigilante, a division of Leo Burnett. Christopher Polosinski, President and Chief Executive Officer of Land O'Lakes. Also attending our annual meeting for the first time is the second of our three new directors, Sally Smith, President and Chief Executive Officer of Buffalo Wild Wings. And our third new director with us tonight is Stephen White, President, Comcast West Division. The second item of business is the board's request that the stockholders ratify the Audit Committee's appointment of Ernst & Young as independent registered public accounting firm for fiscal 2015. The third item of business is the advisory vote on executive compensation. As outlined in the proxy statement, the board believes the company's compensation programs have been effective and recommends a vote for the adoption of the resolution to approve the compensation of the company's named executive officers. The fourth item of business is the consideration of a stockholder proposal, which was included in the proxy statement for this meeting. I will now recognize Paul Shapiro, representing the Humane Society of the United States, to present the proposal. Please have a mic for Mr. Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow shareholders. My name is Paul Shapiro with the Humane Society of the United States, urging you to vote in favor of the shareholder proposal. 
The subject of the proposal, for those of you who have not read it, regards the treatment of pigs in the pork supply chain for Hormel. Hormel very positively made an announcement that it would be phasing out the confinement of breeding pigs on its company-owned farms in what are known as gestation crates. It's customary in many of the pork production facilities in our country to lock breeding pigs, these 500-pound social intelligent animals, inside of cages that are barely larger than their own bodies. The animals are unable even to turn around for nearly their entire lives. Many of them have their muscles atrophy. They develop pressure sores from laying in the same position for hours on end. In fact, the, this is such an inhumane practice that many of the biggest pork buyers in the country, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Costco, and Safeway, have already announced that they will stop buying pork from facilities that use these gestation crates because they're so inhumane. In fact, experts like Dr. Temple Grandin say that this practice is so inhumane that it needs to be phased out of the pork industry. Now, Hormel has done the right thing by getting rid of these inhumane crates from its company-owned facilities, but that represents only a very small portion of the Hormel supply chain. And Hormel, unfortunately, is now lagging behind its competitors like Smithfield and Cargill and Hatfield, which are removing these cruel crates both from their company-owned facilities and beyond throughout their supply chain. And so what this proposal does is it does not ask you to say whether or not you think that gestation crates for pigs are inhumane or not. The proposal simply asks the shareholders to ask the company to disclose the financial risks that are associated with allowing this type of animal abuse within the Hormel supply chain, something, again, that Hormel's competitors are moving away from and that Hormel is now lagging behind the competition. This is why major firms like Institutional Shareholder Services and Glass-Lewis recommend a vote in favor of this proposal because it is in the shareholder's interest to know what type of reputational risk the company that we are all invested in is taking by allowing this type of inhumanity, inhumanity to persist within the Hormel supply chain. So I thank you so much for listening. I hope that you'll vote in favor of the shareholder proposal, and I hope that Hormel will join companies like Smithfield and Cargill in moving away from this type of practice of locking pregnant pigs in crates where they can't even turn around for essentially their entire lives throughout all of the Hormel family of companies and all the companies they do business with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Animal welfare is a top priority for Hormel Foods, and many of Mr. Shapiro's comments certainly relate to that area. But as he correctly points out, the, the proposition in front of the shareholders this evening really relates to risk. Our company does not face any current risk with respect to this topic. We have pork available from group housing operations if there is demand from customers who value this attribute. In terms of the future, we talk with our customers on a regular basis about this and many other topics. The majority that have made a public statement have provided a date of 2022 or later for a change to be made. We have also sent a letter to all of our hog suppliers asking them to consider incorporating group sow housing into their future projects. Given these factors, we do not believe this topic represents a material risk to the company and we have recommended that our shareholders vote against this proposal. Is there any discussion on any of the four items for business? All of these items were included in the proxy solicitation mailed to you before this meeting. We will now vote on these items of business. Any stockholder who has not voted by proxy and who desires to vote in person by ballot tonight, please raise your hand and keep it raised until an attendant has provided you with a ballot. Please complete and sign the ballot and pass it to the attendant at the end of the aisle. While the balloting is being completed, I'd like to report on executive retirements and advancements during this last year. Mike Devine, Dave Yolke, and Bill Snyder retired in 2014, each concluding a long and distinguished career with the company. We thank them for their contributions and wish them well in retirement. Officer promotions in 2014 included Richard Carlson as Vice President Quality Management, Brian Farnsworth as Senior Vice President Supply Chain, Larry Lyons as Vice President Human Resources, Donnie Temperley as Vice President Grocery Products Operations, and Mark Voppel as Vice President Information Technology Services. I ask all of these officers to stand and be recognized at this time.
This concludes the business portion of the agenda. Since voting on the formal matters on the agenda has been concluded, I declare that the polls are now closed at 8.11 p.m. on January 27, 2015. As in past years, we have a special group in attendance with us here tonight. Our final four best of the best teams will be presenting their projects tomorrow morning to a panel of judges who will select a champion. I ask that these teams please stand and be recognized as I introduce them. First, a team from the corporate office who developed a company-wide label verification system. The Skippy Foods team from Little Rock, Arkansas upgraded plant procedures and testing. Next, Rochelle Foods in Rochelle, Illinois improved bacon yield at their location. And lastly, a team from the Austin plant established a hollow-rimmed vat improvement project. We also conducted our seventh annual environmental sustainability best of the best competition. Our 2014 championship team represents the first time we've had an international winner. The team from our Beijing, China location had dramatic results in reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 60% with their project Blue Sky. This was such a successful undertaking that the plant received recognition from the local government for their efforts. In 2014, we began an innovation best of the best competition. Our inaugural champion team developed our new food service product, Bacon One, and this team consisted of individuals from the corporate office, R&D, and Osceola Foods. They created the only fully cooked bacon on the market today that performs like raw bacon for food service operators. Congratulations to all the teams for their hard work and outstanding projects. Next, Deanna Brady and I will provide more details about our business, as well as outlining some of our plans. Please keep in mind that some of the comments made tonight will be forward-looking. Actual results may differ materially from those projected in these statements. I'm excited to be with you this evening to celebrate another successful year for our company. We were able to achieve 6% growth in sales, topping $9 billion for the first time in company history and we topped out at $2.23 per share when it comes to earnings, a 14% increase. And once again, it was an example of our balanced business model in action. And any given year, we'll often have a business unit or two that is faced with significant challenges, but our other units have been able to more than overcome those, and 2014 was no exception to that. We had fantastic years from Refrigerated Foods Group, Genio Turkey Store, and our international team leading the way. Because of these excellent results, the Board of Directors was able to uh, announce another dividend increase, a very significant one of 25%, up to a nice round, easy to remember, $1 per share. This represents the 49th consecutive year we've been able to generate a dividend increase as a company. That puts us in the top 10 in the United States in terms of corporations with that kind of track record. And we definitely want to continue our heritage of sharing in the success with our valuable team members whether it's our legacy profit sharing program that you'd be familiar with in town, some of our other gain sharing or subsidiary based programs, or the discretionary cash award that we give to all 20,000 team members. All told in 2014, we shared over $30 million with our deserving team members. Part of our recipe for success in the company is the ability to continue to support our key brands in the marketplace, to establish those consumer connections. I'd like to share at this time a loop of our most recent advertising efforts, uh, both brands that maybe you saw in the air last year and some that we're advertising right now in the marketplace. At Jenny O, we heard of a place in Iowa where every Thursday, people ride 10 miles for tacos. We thought we'd show up and surprise them with a better kind of taco made with Jenny O ground turkey, cooked thoroughly to 165. I'd feed my kids turkey tacos over regular tacos any day. I think that they're light and they're just fresh tasting. It's time for a better taco. The tacos tonight were pretty much perfect. Make the switch. Look for Jenny O ground turkey at a store near you. How do you turn French fries into American fries? Now you're talking. God bless America. This is our chili, Hormel Chili. We are Chili Nation. They say a six 
68 yard field goal in high school is impossible. Just because they say it can't be done doesn't mean you have to listen. Hungry is never letting anything stand in the way of your dreams. New Hormel Rev Wraps, 15 grams of protein for those who are hungry. Spam can make eggs more exciting. Spam can make burgers more enticing. Spam can even celebrate all kinds of tasty history. But really, can Yes, Spam can. It's so hard to grab a good meal these days. Ah, uh, would you just? Oh, I just wish you'd stay right where, right there. Just, oh, just stay right there. Don't move. All right. Um, guess I'm gonna have to run. All right. Hey, will you stand still? Hey, come back here, sir. Sir, excuse me. Oh no. Now what am I gonna eat? Sucker. It's great at the top of the food chain. Hormel completes. Don't just survive. Be completely satisfied. What? Is someone talking? Skippy! Yippee! I'm bored. Hashtag bored. Skippy! Yippee! <laughs> this is great. Made with the funnest peanuts ever. Skippy! We continue to enjoy excellent growth with many of our legacy franchises, and we clearly have a lot of investments in place to support our ham, our bacon, our dry sausage business, our canned items such as Spam Lunch and Meat and Hormel Chili. But the team has also tried to find ways to keep the portfolio vi vital by finding new growth opportunities that would add to that portfolio in new areas. And we've really kind of tried to focus these efforts in these four areas depicted on the slide here, to become more global, and we've had excellent growth of our international division to become more multicultural, probably the best example of that would be our Megamex portfolio products, to offer more better for you items, where Genio Turkey Store leads the way, as does Natural Choice within the Hormel portfolio, and then more recently, to offer more on-the-go types of products. And I want to provide you with some examples of both acquisitions and new product innovations that capture some or all of these in terms of the initiatives we have driving forward. First would be Holy Guacamole, an acquisition we made three years ago, and it really, frankly, hits on all four. It is sold on a global basis in the countries depicted on this slide. Clearly a multicultural product, guacamole being a Mexican food item, but actually it's kind of moving over into mainstream because it's now used to add to sandwiches on a regular basis. Definitely viewed as a better for you option to consumers, whether it's the regular Holy Guacamole item or even the organic offering depicted on the slide here. And in terms of on the go, by far the leading item within the Holy Guacamole product line are the Holy Minis that people can utilize on a regular basis to kind of take with them, have lunch, et cetera. Another acquisition is the Skippy acquisition we made about a year and a half ago. Definitely global, $100 million in sales were brought on board, including a great new team in Weifang, China that handles the production for Asia, as well as the Little Rock team. You saw Eric on the slide tonight, and we have a fantastic team down there as well. Better for you in the sense that it delivers a great seven grams of protein per serving in the regular product line, and the natural is the leading natural player within the peanut butter space. And in terms of on the go, our grocery products team introduced Skippy Singles this year, and they were a progressive grocer editor's pick for one of the best new items, a very successful item available both in our regular creamy style as well as the natural. Rev is not an acquisition. Rev was a new product innovation that our team from R&D and marketing created and have put into the marketplace, really honed in and focused against those latter two attributes. Better for you in the sense of the protein delivery that these products provide, 15 grams of protein for, per serving or more, and definitely on the go. Consumable hot, cold, throw it in your backpack, et cetera, was shown on the commercial. Uh, this year we augmented the line with Rev morning wraps, and, and that's, they're off to a great start as well. And the big exciting news for this year, adding to the portfolio, was muscle milk. Muscle milk is global, over $20 million in sales outside the United States, with particular emphasis in Australia and Canada, but it really is ripe for further expansion in many other markets. Protein drinks are hot in many parts of the world. We have the leading brand in the United States, so we don't see any reason why we cannot grow that franchise in multiple markets. 
Mulsum milk is all about better for you. It is high in protein, low in sugar, low in carbs, really delivers for whether it's a, a serious athlete or any of us are just trying to be uh, on the go on a regular basis. And speaking of on the go, the hallmark items within the, the Muscle Milk franchise are the ready-to-drink items that consumers use as a breakfast replacement or after workout and so forth. And we're very excited to be able to expand our line of bar products coming up here soon as well because those will be great on-the-go offerings also. I want to share with you uh, here a video that was done for our national sales meeting back in November. Uh, it includes comments from one of their athletic spokespeople depicted here, Clay Matthews from the Green Bay Packers, and also some great comments from Mr. Greg Pickett, the founder of the company. We'll go ahead and run that. I wish I could be there in person, but I've got my work cut out for me on the football field. I'm excited to be a part of the Hormel family through my partnership with Cytosport. I was first introduced to Muscle Milk as a walk-on freshman at USC. My strong work ethic, intense workouts, and conditioning routine helped me go from a college walk-on to an NFL first round draft pick, and Muscle Milk has been with me throughout the journey. Nutrition plays a huge role in my training, and I've been loyal to the Muscle Milk brand as their products and people have supported me from the beginning. Because I had used the product so extensively throughout my career, I knew there was one call to make for a sports nutrition partner. You are now a part of the Muscle Milk story, and you have such a great opportunity to tell that story through your sales and marketing efforts. I'm excited for what lies ahead with the brand and our partnership. So thanks again for your support. I look forward to working with you guys. On behalf of the Pickett family and the entire Cytosport team, we are thrilled to be part of the Hormel Foods family. Our companies have much in common, a rich history of innovation, a focus on protein and nutrition, and a culture that values integrity and family. I'm proud of what our team has accomplished, and we are confident that the future is full of opportunity. We look forward to working closely with you to grow this business and continue to dominate the enhanced protein category. Now I'd like to introduce some special guests. Joining us tonight are members of the Pickett family who founded the Cytosport business. Please welcome Greg Pickett, Mike Pickett, and Nikki Pickett-Brown. We are happy these Californians braved our Minnesota temperatures in January, although we didn't really give them a full dose of January, Minnesota, but they're with us here this evening. I'd like them to stand. Please. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Deanna Brady, who is going to tell us about our company's outstanding food service group. Good evening, and thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. It's my privilege to share the Hormel Foods food service story with you tonight. But first, I'd like to ask you to think about your most recent experience in food service. Some of you may be wondering what a food service experience is. Anytime you have a meal at a restaurant, students eat on campus, or patients, staff, or visitors eat at a healthcare facility, those are all food service experiences. Food service is a part of all of our lives, and that's why the food service division is an important part of Hormel Foods. It started 25 years ago through the vision of Dick Knowlton and Jim Cole. The vision was, if we can sell our products to people who eat at home, then why not sell our food service products to operators who serve people when they eat away from home? This led to the formation of the Food Service Division in 1990 under Refrigerated Foods. Even though food away from home was growing faster than retail at the time, the group's success was faced with skepticism, even from our own employees. We were a small group, and we started with opportunity and little else. 
As you can imagine, it didn't take long for us to develop a chip on our shoulder and a passion for proving that our small, talented, and driven team would produce results for our company. We were determined to set ourselves apart by having a sales force that focused on food service and sold value-added national brands to operators. The founders of this group had great instincts and intuition, and the group enjoyed double-digit growth for over a decade. These photos taken at our two regional sales meeting show our team today. 180 sales, marketing, and national account professionals. We look a little different, and our group has evolved to meet the needs of the business and our customers. We're regarded as experts dedicated to the specific needs in the industry, like chain restaurants, military, convenience, college and universities, and healthcare. Selling our food service products is challenging work. Our team jumped in the car every day to work face-to-face -face with our operators and our distributor partners. They spend countless hours preparing for, driving to, and following up with our customers to ensure we close the sale. They don't walk in the front door of the restaurant, they walk around back to the kitchen where the chef is. Yes, it's challenging work, but it's very rewarding. Our success comes from our sales professionals developing relationships, knowing our customers' businesses, and helping present menu ideas to help them solve problems and remain profitable. A key reason for our division's success is our culture of accountability. Our number one and most important belief is that results matter. As I mentioned earlier, our group grew at double digits for over a decade. And you would think that once you find a successful formula, all you have to do is stick to it. Well, that would work if nothing ever changed in our economy. But it did change. In early 2000, we began to see the food service industry slowing down. Our group quickly adjusted its focus to new customers and new products to help operators remain successful. We also began training our sales force to adjust their selling strategies. History has proven that those changes were right on the mark to put us in a position to successfully manage our division through the recession, which began in 2007. And what a recession it was. Consumers saw gas prices skyrocket while their home values crashed. The stock markets tumbled and unemployment grew at an alarming rate. All of these factors converged in 2007, causing the most significant decline in the history of the restaurant industry, which is still in recovery today. As we continue to help our customers rebound from the recession, we're also taking a systematic approach to growing our division. This pyramid illustrates our growth strategy. Well, we can't control the economy, weather, or unemployment. We can control to whom we sell and what we sell to help drive profits and growth. Tonight, we'll look at all three sources with particular attention to focus segments and innovation and how they've helped us deliver positive growth to our company and profits to our shareholders. In our first decade, we built a solid foundation by selling to restaurants and hotels. But as I said earlier, we began to see a shift coming in the restaurant industry. To prepare for these changes, we diversified our customer base to include other segments, like college and universities and healthcare. In 2012, we established a new position titled National Sales Manager of College and Universities. This position was designed to increase our credibility and propel our growth in this channel. One of our experienced and successful sales professionals by the name of Greg Hetfield accepted this role, and he continues to drive our business today. I'd like to introduce you to Greg and have him show you our approach to college and university food service and how we work together to solve for their needs of their students and staff. One of the most rewarding things when I'm on campus is, first and foremost, that I get to work with food service professionals that share the same passion that we do in, in providing food. Understand that we're providing food for 
potentially your child, my child, and we're really making a difference because food plays a very important role in the maturation of the student. There are 7,000 plus colleges and universities. Some of the larger ones serve up to 50,000 meals per day. And that's kind of where we come in being a resource to those customers. My approach to what I do really mirrors our food service approach in that regard. I like to lead by example with our teams to get on campuses, you know, to take our local people in those marketplaces and really get to know our customers, understand their business, see their operations, meet their teams and see what their challenges are that they're facing to where we can create some solutions for them. You need to be able to understand the customer, their processes and protocols and how they go to business and what their expectations are. We challenge our salespeople to make their first calls without a sample bag. And if you think about it, that goes against everything we've been taught in sales. But the goal for that first call is to understand the customer's business, understand their processes, their protocols, their expectations of vendors. And ultimately, we want to identify how we can become a resource to that customer and create value. Our clients and, and key customers perceive our approach is spot on. We're told numerous times that the approach of getting to know their business is what is appealing to them. I get to lead our team in vision and strategy within the college and university segment. More importantly, what we're doing, we're providing food to universities that make a difference. As a result of our focused efforts in the college and university channel since 2012, we've delivered a compound annual growth rate of 19%, and we still have a lot of growth potential within this area. Because of our positive results with college and universities, we mirrored this approach and tailored it for the healthcare industry. In 2013, we added a national sales manager for the healthcare area, and we're very pleased when one of our marketing professionals by the name of Anne Marie Vopel accepted this challenge. Anne Marie will now share how our team engages the needs of healthcare food service professionals. And I spend a lot of time in healthcare kitchens, whether it be in a senior living facility or whether it be in an actual hospital, talking to operators, watching products move through their system, watching how the staff interacts with the food that they're preparing, whether it be for patients or whether it be for the retail side of the business, feeding staff and family members or visitors. It's critical that we spend time with our customers and watch how their operation and their system works to be able to make the most relevant suggestions. I think initially our customers were kind of shocked by this because it was unique to have a manufacturing sales rep come in and ask purely with the goal of understanding their business and nothing else. It helps me understand what the most relevant products are I have in my portfolio to match up with their needs because we will be the first to go to market with those items. Our customer's agenda and their business objectives is our primary interest, not so much just going in there and showing them a whole bunch of products and hoping that one of them might be of interest. If we're actively listening and we're hearing what that customer is telling us their needs and challenges are, we will be ready and able to select the right product, the most relevant solution, and help them meet their business objectives. So I'm always thinking about what's next from an innovation perspective. How is healthcare reform going to affect the way our customers get their business done and how are we going to help them meet those changing needs? and how do we equip our sales force to be the most powerful solution providers they can be for this critical customer group. It takes it to the next level for me when I get to do it inside the healthcare segment because I am a firm believer that our products can be a critical piece of the healing process for people. And I think for me, that's highly rewarding and exciting and fun and I can't imagine at this point in my career doing anything else. Through these efforts, we're delivering a 10% growth rate in the healthcare area, and we're very bullish about our future. This diversified customer base offers a stable, consistent growth vehicle for our division. The second pillar in our growth pyramid is our high growth categories. These are the product lines that have a point of difference from our competitors, are extremely convenient for our customers, and are strong profit drivers for our division. Targeting our focus segments with these brands is very rewarding. 
These brands not only resonate with our customers because they address menu trends or operational issues, but they also provide amazing results to our division. It's critical for our team to protect and grow these categories and align our sales and marketing focus to these brands. Additionally, it's important to keep these products fresh and relevant to continue growing not only our businesses, but our customers' businesses. We do that through innovation. Our group's commitment to innovation separates us from the competition and serves as a calling card to bring exciting new products to customers. Once they see and taste them, they can't live without them. In fact, these products serve as a springboard for their own menu creation. We believe so strongly in this. In 2009, during the heart of the recession, we selected a passionate individual to lead innovation within our group. Bill Dion is a sales and marketing veteran who oversees our process from start to finish. As a result of his passion and our execution, we're on track to exceed our portion of Mr. Ettinger's $3 billion challenge one year early. Let's hear how Bill approaches innovation, and I guarantee that he'll leave you excited about the role it has in the success of our company. Food, is, as we all know, is really a fundamental pleasure of our life. Food has the power to really unite people, to inspire people, to excite people, and I believe our role in this industry is to really deliver solutions, food products, that do just that. I think about our customers first, and the ability for Hormel Foods and for me to help them be successful, that's what drives me, and that's what drives our division. We observe customers, what's going on in their kitchens, and products are born out of the needs that we see back at the house. Other times, products are just born out of how our country is changing. So all of our products, each one has a unique story. When talking to customers, one of the things they're always looking for from a manufacturer is they want to see innovative products because in order for them to survive, their menus have to change. They realize that. Customers are hungry for new products and new ideas. So anytime we show them a new innovation, they get very, very excited. A brand is just a reason to make a choice. And if a brand's a reason to make a choice, I want our customers choosing Hormel. And the only way that's gonna happen is if our products stay fresh, stay relevant. We're doing more research than we've ever done. We have more contact with more customers than we've ever had before. We are building what I call the circle of innovation. All these touch points that we have with all of these customers that are feeding us all the feedback we need to have this sort of pipeline of innovation, I believe we're gonna be able to fill uh, with more speed, with more agility than ever before. One thing that differentiates us from many companies is we just don't settle. I'll tell you, in the process of innovation, I'll look at iterations of a product that R&D is showing. And I, I know that I can be sort of a pain to them because I'm gonna tell them, no, it's not quite good enough. We're always asking and pushing for one more thing. We have this relentless desire just to do a little better all the time. And that's in the Hormel DNA. And that is certainly in my DNA. And I think that <laughs> causes us to do a better job than most. As you can see, efforts towards our focus segments of healthcare and college and universities, coupled with our innovative products, have delivered solid results, and we have consistently outpaced the growth trends in the food service industry for the past five years. We started this group 25 years ago as an outside bet. Today, that bet continues to pay off and our team of dedicated road warriors remains humble and proud to deliver consistent growth and profit to refrigerated foods and the Hormel Foods Corporation. Our ability to identify new customers and deliver on-trend menu solutions through a talented and unique sales team has allowed us to exceed industry growth rates even during the worst of times. And our profit contributions are accretive to refrigerated foods. 
I hope tonight's look at our team and the food service industry will give you a new perspective and appreciation the next time you sit down to enjoy bacon at a restaurant, a sandwich at a deli, or order pizza on a Friday night. The first 25 years of our division have been amazing, and our future is even brighter. Thank you. Well, it should come as no surprise that our food service group receives recognition from its customers on a regular basis, given that fantastic performance. During this past year, we were named Cisco Food Services Gold Supplier Award winner in the pork category. And if any of you have ever been to a Pizzeria Uno in Chicago, they were named Uno Chicago Grills Vendor of the Year. Our international food service team was also recognized as Papa John's International Supplier of the Year. In the areas of general recognition, we're still proud to be one of CR Magazine's best corporate citizens, proud to be a, a top place to work for veterans, and we were rated for the second year in a row in the top 15 in terms of Chief Executive Magazine's best companies for leadership development. We take pride in being active in our local communities, and the Austin community is certainly no exception to that. Uh, we gave over half a million dollars in direct financial grants within the community this past year, ranging from the Apple Lane uh, Child Care Center to the Cedar Valley expansion to the dollar program at the YMCA. Uh, and this doesn't count the significant United Way initiatives at both the corporate office and at the Austin plant. We continue to be active in terms of educational support ranging from our matching programs for kindergarten through 12th grade institutions, as well as colleges and universities, and also our scholarship program, Hormel Food Scholarships, uh, that are granted to the sons and daughters of our employees throughout the company. And still our most significant effort is in the area of hunger alleviation. Oh, nearly $7 million this past year in both food and cash donations, much of which came, stayed here in the United States, but it also includes our wonderful project Spammy in Guatemala, where we've designed our customized product uh, aimed at addressing malnutrition within that community. You know, each year when we make the presentation, we're always talking about kind of this year's results. Obviously, the, the shareholders are interested in seeing how the past year went. But we try to take a very long-term perspective at Hormel Foods. We've been around 123 years and certainly hope to be around for a lot longer. And so whether you look at our results over the past five years in terms of stock performance, which clearly our shareholders should be of keen interest to you, or we're, we're, we've exceeded our peers in both the food and beverage space as well as the overall S&P 500, or if you just look at our financial performance, especially against our goals. Our goal is to grow sales at a clip of about 5% a year, grow earnings at 10% a year. And those goals are at the top of the food industry. And our team has done a great job of not only meeting those goals, but exceeding them with a 7% compound growth rate in sales, topping out at over $9 billion, and a 12% growth rate in terms of our earnings. I'm strongly a believer that our, we have the team in place, the strategies and the executional capabilities to continue this kind of growth in the future, and that's what we intend to do for our shareholders. Thank you. So the inspectors of elections have now completed the tabulations on the voting, and our secretary has a report on this voting. Mr. Johnson, will you please give us that report? Mr. Chairman, each of items one through three, as identified in the proxy statement and voted upon by stockholders here tonight, has been approved by the required vote. Item four, as identified in the proxy statement, the stockholder proposal has been defeated by a majority vote. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. The final tabulation of the vote will be included in a Form 8K filed with the SEC in the next few days. As many of you know, we are bringing the Spam Museum to downtown Austin. We are planning to open the new, mu new museum in the spring of 2016, which is also the 125th anniversary of our company. I wanted to let you know that in the meantime, the Spam store remains open, located next door to games people play. We are very excited about the museum and what it will mean for downtown Austin and Mauer County when it is completed. <laughs> 